Hello everyone, I'm Marco Donnarumma. I'm an artist and a scholar. I work with bodies, sounds and machine uh, to make stage production, installation, performances. Right now I'm uh, at the Akademie für Theater und Digitalität in Dortmund and uh, I want to thank them for providing us all this space and equipment to record this talk. So the talk today is uh, about body and digitality, or in other words, about body and technology in the arts. Uh, in particular, the talk will provide an overview of historical work that starting in the 60s have begun to explore the relation between body and technology in performance practice. And this will be the introduction to my own work and my work in collaboration with the artist group Fronte Vacuo, which I co-founded with Margherita Pedra and Andrea Familari. I want to trace a particular trajectory during this talk. It will be a historical and cultural trajectory, if so to say. It's not going to be a history of theatre, it's not going to be a history of dance, it's not going to be a history of media art, but it's going to be a trajectory across all these histories to show how they are interconnected and especially to show that what is happening today, uh, the growing interest in digitality, in digital technology, artificial intelligence and so forth, it's nothing new, really, but comes out of a very long tradition and history of artists that have worked in a lot of different fields. We will start with works that date back to the 60s. Uh, this does not mean that the 60s is the beginning point of art and technology. Uh, art and technology has been existing since uh, Leonardo da Vinci's time and probably earlier than that. Uh, but that's a good point because we will see that there is a key moment in history when different artists got together to experiment with this medium. And uh, we will arrive up to 2020, this year, with some of the latest production that we created. And uh, what I want to show here is the importance of transdisciplinarity, of the coupling of art and science, and the importance of feminism, feminist art, feminist studies, and feminist initiatives in positing the body as the center of a very fertile artistic discourse in the performing arts. So we start with the first work that I want to mention is uh, this piece entitled Music for Solo Performer by Alvin Lucier. So this work is from 1965 and uh, it was quite groundbreaking from from the time that it was made. So essentially, the performer, Alvin Lucier, also better known for his composition of experimental music. In this case, uh, Lucier was sitting on stage with uh, a cup of electrodes on his head. And uh, while staying completely still, he would try to enter certain states of mind which would produce particular brain waves, particular pattern of brain waves that the electrode would capture. The electrode were in turn connected in a total analog way to uh, some tiny robotic arms that would hit some real percussion. 
So essentially, the, per the music performance was also a theatrical performance, obviously, because of its staging, was about creating music and rhythm through an intimate look into the brainwave producing process of the performer. It was quite groundbreaking from the, for the time and uh, Lucier was able to do this work because he collaborated with uh, an engineer that used to work for the Air Force in the US and, uh, and this engineer had available this particular technology because they were studying and doing research on the experience of pilots in uh, super fast jets. And this is a very good example to show how art and science can connect in interesting and innovative way and in ways that are not aimed uh, at developing further the industry or the science itself, but rather to explore different relationships that exist between us, our bodies, and technology. The next work, the uh, project that I want to mention is uh, Experiments in Art and Technology, abbreviated as EAT, IT. And this is a large-scale project that involved a lot of different artists. Uh, uh, it was founded in 67, uh, just a couple of years after Lucier did his performance. And um, it was a large collective, pretty loose but uh, quite tight at the same time, including uh, musicians, such as John Cage, David Tudor, and uh, dancers like Merce Cunningham, and a lot of other artists um, who found themselves together in a certain moment in time uh, where they, they could have the possibility to work with technology, especially in relation to the company AT&T. And uh, they started organizing happening where they would put their expertise together on stage to create these performances of uh, procedural music and procedural choreography with participative actions and a sort of technologically mediated happening. And this was a milestone, I would say, in the history of art and technology because it, it set a standard for how different artists can combine their expertise into projects that are obviously more than the sum of each expertise in each field. Because what emerges from this project is a new language and again, a new language that uses technology to explore relations between body, sound, and movement. Next is uh, another artist called Marcelli Antunez Roca. Uh, he was one of the co-founders of La Fura del Baus, which you probably know as this controversial and fantastic performance art group. So Marcelli Antunez Roca uh, be began working as a solo artist around the 90s and uh, in 94 he produced this uh, stage production entitled Epizoo and uh, here he would combine uh, different kind of aesthetics into a sort of camp performance uh, about the grotesque uh, and uh, and the experience of a body that is grotesque just because it's a body. And what this body can do, what this body can be forced to be doing. So in particular in this performance, he wear a sort of exoskeleton, although technically it's not an exoskeleton, but he wears all these machines that are, are like pinching his, his flesh and uh, as they are triggered, 
by remote controllers, the, the machine starts pitching his, his flesh and because he's wearing these machines on his face as well, then his body starts mutating and losing control to the machine, so to say. And uh, at the same time, sensors from his body and from the floor, uh, the stage floor, capture information about his movements and his muscular state and trigger a narrative displayed on a large projection screen behind him that is made of animations particularly designed for, for this piece that again play with the notions of, of normalized gender, normalized bodies, uh, bringing to the stage this grotesque and, and probably humorful approach to this kind of investigation around the body. Next, I want to talk a bit about VNS Matrix. So this was, and still is, actually, they started working again since a few years together, uh, a collective of, um, of artists um, that were among the pioneers of cyber feminism. Now, this, this is a, a very important point in the history of art and technology. All the performances that I mentioned earlier, they were all possi possible to show in public because in the 70s, in the early 70s, there was the feminist movement and performance art grew increasingly public. Uh, pushed forward by the incredible energy of women artists, non-male artists that were politically and culturally interested in reappropriating their own body and fight against uh, the normalization of the non-male body, of the female body. So everything that we, we've seen until now, it was possible because this feminist movement and feminist art was pushing the edge of what was possible to discuss in public and in art. So with this premise, we arrive again at VNS Matrix, uh, pioneers of cyber feminism. So they take the, the feminism activities and initiatives I just mentioned and bring it forward into the cyberspace. So we are in 1995 and the uh, internet exists publicly since a couple of years, I think. And uh, this collective is uh, working since a few years already with the possibilities of the internet. And in this particular work, Corpus Fantastica MOO, they take the stage of a multi-user uh, online game and multi-user online dungeon. And they enter this space with their avatars and they create happening and performances within the cyberspace. And obviously their approach is unique and because it, first of all, it's aimed at discarding the dominance of patriarchal society as we have them uh, in uh, capitalized, capitalistic societies. And uh, they do this through technology. So they reappropriate technology that are um, stereotypically imagined for this vision of males in control of technology, exploring the cyberspace like heroes. They reappropriate this imagery and this concept and they just turn it upside down, putting the female body and the non-male body at the center of the discourse in a provocative way. So this is another great milestone for the discourse of body and technology. And we have this work by Seiko Mikami. Uh, this is much closer to, to my approach, which we will see later. Seiko Mikami was a Japanese uh, artist uh, 
pioneer of media art and, and performative installation. So this work is from 97 and it's called World Membrane and the Dismembered Body. So in this work, Mikami created another performative installation where the body was the main focus. So she would take uh, an anechoic chamber, so a chamber where uh, sound from the outside is completely muted. And uh, within this space, she would put a medical chair in the center of the room and uh, a series of sound speakers surrounding the visitor on the chair. What would happen in the space with the visitor alone in it was that uh, sensors on the body of the visitor captured sound from the visitor internal organs and living process and played back these sounds through this system of loudspeakers. There was also um, a latency that was created on, on purpose by Mikami between the actual sound as it is captured and the playback of it in space. And this was aimed at creating a gap that would alienate for a moment the visitor from the sound of its own body, creating these distances which, which Mikami, as a pioneer as she was, uh, so as an important element because it, it reflected on the possibility of increasing distance that technology creates between us and our bodies. I found this a very interesting reflection. As you can see, we are, we are seeing work that they are not technically theatrical, uh, but they are definitely live and uh, they are performative because they are live, they are performative because they are emergent, and they are performative because they perform the body through technology. I think this is important also in the sense of thinking about technology as a, a disembodied medium is not helpful. Technology is something that human made, as other type of technology are made by animals. Uh, but with our type of technology, that is something that comes from our body and from our bodily experience in the world. So I believe personally it, it's crucial to go deeply into the implication of specific types of technology in regard to bodily experience and social understanding of bodies and social normalization of bodies. Because technology and normalization and so forth, they are intimately connected. That said, we can come to another work which is really important. This is, I chose to show this work even if it doesn't happen in a real space, it only happens on the internet. Uh, but I think it's one of the strongest uh, artistic statement uh, on the relation between body and technology and how technology can be used to emphasize this relation or reveal other aspects of it. So the artist is uh, Shuli Chang and she created between 98 and 99 this work called Brandon. So Brandon was uh, technically a website where you could interact with images and uh, by through your interaction with these images you would slowly unveil uh, fragments of the story of Brandon Tina, who was um, um, a trans boy at the time that was raped and killed when it was discovered that um, he had a different biological sex. 
And again, we are in 19, uh, 99, 98, 99, so if you reflect a bit, I think also about the historical point in time that we are in, you can see also the significance of, of this work in a better light. And uh, again, this work happened as an interactive uh, web project, but it also had live happening uh, um, sometimes in, in a few venues. Uh, Shuli Chang, for those interested, uh, is a great artist doing a lot of performances and participative and transdisciplinary performance, so I recommend to look at her work uh, more in detail. And here we find Stellark. For those who don't know, Stellark is uh, an established and well-known artist uh, who is a performance artist and a sculptor. Uh, although he became uh, well known for his work with uh, prosthetic technology, uh, working in Second Life, and projects that were focused on a visceral approach to the body as an object to be sculpted and manipulated into new forms of embodiment. And here instead we look at this work entitled Exoskeleton uh, from 99. So here he uh, worked with engineers and designers and roboticists to create a massive exoskeleton uh, that was not really a functional exoskeleton. It would not augment the artist's physical capability, but it would rather mess them up. So the machine itself was not optimized for speed or power or anything, as you can see. But uh, what happened was that different sensors on, on belly and upper arms of Stellark's body would control the legs of this machine. So there you have a short circuit. Uh, you're not moving your legs to control the legs of the machine. You have to move other muscles that are unrelated to the concept of leg. So this creates a short circuit in your embodiment and, and I find it a very interesting way of exploring performance with machines. Uh, this is a tenet of Stellark uh, work with prosthesis and robotics. And uh, this was staged as a performance, so Stellark would enter the stage already inside this machine and, and walk throughout the stage using also the sounds of the machine to create a musical composition in real time. And then we come to uh, the last work of this historical review, then we'll, we'll pass on to my work and my work with Fronte Vacuo. Um, this is a, an Italian collective called uh, Santa Sangre, it's still active now. And uh, we jump a bit ahead in time, we are in 2008. And with this piece entitled Sei Gradi, Santa Sangre was among the first companies in dance uh, to exploit uh, their highly technically skilled uh, artist to create an environment for a staged dance performance that would literally melt the difference between uh, uh, real and virtual. So they, will they would use sophisticated uh, methods to overlap video projection in multiple dimensions, all stuff that we see now as very common these days, and in dance at least. And. Uh, that was not the only element, though, because what, what I really like about their work is the, the combination between movement, uh, images, and sound to create a sensory experience. It, 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 it's something that goes beyond a, a dance piece, um, not in a quality manner. It's not a matter of best or worst. It's just a different way of approaching the discipline. And um, they, it, it, there, is a, there is a strong sensual and sensorial aspect to their work, which I really like, and, and sometimes reminds me also of the work of Societas Raffaello Sanzio. So in that sense, there is 
deep aesthetic research in Santa Sangre's work about the combination of body, sound, and images, which I find another milestone in the recent history of art and technology for the performing arts. So now I would like to move on to my own work, but hopefully this historical review helps you constructing some kind of timeline um, that of course I hope is useful for your research and your work and it should serve well as an introduction to my own practice. So as I said in the beginning, I, I work with stage production, I work with body and technology. I'm a performer, but I'm, I make the music of my own performances. I program the stuff that needed to be programmed. And I do work with a large team of collaborators. I will be mentioned at the end of this talk. And, um, and some of these collaboration then crystallize in larger projects, such as our artist group Front Evacuum. So that is to say transdisciplinarity is at the core of my practice and of my collaborative practice. To make the long story short, uh, I, I began in 2004 to work and to work at a professional level. Then in 2010 was a key point in my career where I created the Accents, which is uh, a wearable musical instrument that amplifies uh, acoustic vibration from inside the body and allows the performer to compose this sound and manipulate them digitally through movement, choreography and so on. That was a turning point because that's the moment when I started focusing only on the body. And then from there, jumping forward, I did a PhD at Goldsmiths University of London, uh, where I had the chance to study with Atau Tanaka and Matthew Fuller. And uh, there I developed um, a deep interest for cultural studies of the body, uh, including uh, feminist uh, theories again, but also study cultural studies of disability and um, all together this pushed me into developing a particular research uh, around somatic practices. So this is a, a good in, uh, premise to talk about the cycle of works that I completed in 2019. It started in 2014, the seven configuration. So this is a cycle of installation and performances. Um, here I will just talk about the performances and um, what is a configuration. So a configuration is a different way of inhabiting a body through technology. So you take parts of a machine, you take parts of a body, put them together on a stage and that what you created is a configuration. So we could say the whole cycle is the staging of these seven different configurations where uh, human performers develop different ways of being a body and of having a body in relation to robotic prosthesis developed by myself in collaboration with the Neurobotics Research Laboratory and Anna Rajcevic. And these robotic prostheses are embedded with artificial intelligence algorithm. Now, this is the premise. We'll get now to the specific works. We'll get more into the details. So the first work of the series is Corpus Nil. This is a solo performance um, for human performer and an algorithmic performer. So what happens is a sort of ritual of birth of an unfamiliar creature. So what you see on stage is a body that it seems human, but it's not human enough to be defined as such. 
and it moves like an animal, it has an instinct, but it doesn't have a goal, really. And what happens is, is a morphing, is a, is a birthing of this body into something unknown. How this is possible? Uh, there is a technical apparatus behind, um, there is my body on stage and everything is uh, blacked out. And um, there is only one lead bar in front of my body and uh, my arms and my head are painted in black. And what happens is I have sensors on uh, my arms that capture the sound of my muscle vibrating as I move and also the electricity that activates my muscle. And um, the algorithms that are running on the computer uh, which is machine learning, or as everybody says these days, artificial intelligence, although that's a very tricky term. There's not much room to talk about it now. But let's stick with machine learning. So there is machine learning algorithm that autonomously identifies features of my muscular activity as I perform this uh, improvisatory choreography and in response to this feature of my movement, the algorithm generates sound and light patterns. So what you see on stage is actually the result of this uh, choreographed improvisation, so to say, between the human performer and the algorithm. So what's interesting is that I cannot control the action of the algorithm with my movement. It's not a direct relationship, I move, the algorithm does something. It's, it's quite the opposite. I can try to influence the algorithm by moving in certain ways, by having certain movement qualities. Uh, but the algorithm will eventually decide by itself what kind of pattern to produce. And this makes the whole performance much more alive, if you want, because there is this actual risk of not knowing what, what will happen next. So I find this quite interesting. And uh, this aspect was uh, something that I developed further uh, when I started creating uh, the robotic prosthesis that I mentioned earlier. One prosthesis that uh, we use in a piece uh, is called Ray, and it's a fascial prosthesis. Uh, this is for the piece Eingeweide which I created with uh, Margherita Pevere. And uh, in Eingeweide there is this idea of subtracting functions from the human body and put this body on stage, give them a choreography, but give them also an inability to perform this choreography. What will happen? That's the whole point of, of the performance for me. And um, conceptually the piece is about an unstable coagulation of, of these human bodies, these prosthetic bodies and other bacteria bodies that are uh, in the form of a cellulose mask that Margherita Pevere cultivated and, and then design for the performance. And what happens is this, this coalescence of these bodies, they separate themselves and they try to get together again. It's always a struggle, it's always a suspended narrative. There isn't really an end to the struggle of these bodies on, on stage. Uh, technically speaking, uh, the prosthesis here, Ray, uh, it's uh, let's say it's derived by this interest of mine of improvising with machines. So to what extent can we improvise with uh, artificially intelligent machines? I would not use the term artificial intelligence as I mentioned earlier, but I do believe there is a sort of computational intelligence. And so while creating this robotics prosthesis, that was my main focus. So the prosthesis are designed in a way they do not have any instruction to follow. What they do have is a, a sensory system that 
allows them to understand information about their own body in space. And according to that information, they produce movement and they produce different behaviors. So they are improvising machines in a way similar to uh, living things, although they are very basic approximation of the full capability of a living being. Nevertheless, it is quite fun and interesting to perform with them. So in the particular case of Eingeweide, because the, the prosthesis is blocking my gaze, I cannot see anything in front of me. I can only see it peripherally and behind me. So in order to perform the choreography, which is, is very tense and works on the limits of the body, on the limits of movement, in order to perform this choreography, I have to listen to the vibration of the motors of the prosthesis. The prosthesis has servo motors that move and they produce vibration when they move. So because the motors are basically coming out of my face, my, my face is in direct contact with them. And so one way that I developed to actually become aware of where I was on stage was to uh, find some kind of resonance between the vibration of the motors and, and my own body. Then, on the other hand, because the prosthesis is on, on my body, the prosthesis has to adapt to my movement too. And so here we are again with this balance and balance between human-machine interaction and, and the improvisation between different bodies. So what interests me in all of this is the configuration. So this new mode of inhabiting a different bodies and what kind of story this body can tell. This approach was developed further in another stage production entitled Aliat Sutai, uh, which I created with Nunu Kong. Uh, this was an international production uh, funded by the Goethe Institute and it happened between Berlin and Shanghai over two years of research. And uh, here, uh, for this piece, we developed other two specific prostheses coming from the same template of the previous one, but uh, specifically designed for the type of interaction and type of bodies that the other performers, um, Nunu Kong and Ling Ling Chang. And again, this I find it interesting because it's about uh, thinking of, of a piece of technology as a robotic prosthesis as something that has a specific relation with a human or with another environment. It's not just a general piece of code or a general piece of hardware that can just be put in any place and works. That, that's not the way it works. Uh, these kind of machines become interesting to play with only when they are specifically designed for particular bodies. So this is another good reflection about the relation between different type of technology and different type of bodies. And uh, in Aliyah Tsutai, what happens is um, a reckless uh, struggle between the, the three human performers who each wish desperately to own or disown one of these prostheses. And so it's a story about relationship between group of people and group of machines. So as you can see, there is in, 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 these, um, in these different pieces some kind of red thread. We start from Corpus Nil, where it's the analysis of this unformed body, this body that is not a body, it's just coming to life. And then we move on to Eingeweide, that is the story of multiple bodies, but still in a very intimate setting and quite intimate relationship. And then in Aliyah Tsutai, we get to a higher level uh, where we have group dynamics and uh, more complex dramaturgy as well, which was of course reflected on the technical uh, needs of the piece as well in terms of lighting, staging, machines and so on. And um, there are other works in the cycle, I'm, I'm not going to mention now, there are more installation works. Uh, but well, uh, what it's important is that during the creation of this cycle, then I began collaborating with uh, Margherita Pevere, which I already mentioned, and with Andrea Familari. And um, 
from this transdisciplinary collaboration between the three of us, so me, a performer, artist, stage director, uh, Margherita, a visual artist, bio artist and performer, Andrea, a visual artist, uh, a video expert and uh, technology savvy in all uh, contexts of arts. There we started working together, developing ideas together and that's how we eventually arrived at founding uh, Fronte Vacuo, our artist group. So we founded this group in 2019, last year, just before the corona pandemic. And uh, we founded the group with the goal to reflect on, on the increasing uh, devastation of the natural environment and how that is connected to technological development and the histories and identities of bodies in our society. So uh, our first work is a large project that entitled Humane Methods. And Humane Methods is a rhizomatic project. It's made up of different performances that all look at a particular aspect of the main topic, which is violence in algorithmic societies. So algorithmic society, I intend societies that are dominated by an algorithmic way of living, uh, which means also algorithmic infrastructure, like our European societies, like American societies, some Eastern societies and others in the world. And um, of course, violence in society is nothing new, but what is new is the form of this violence, how this violence is extended into many other domains through the use of technology. So Humane Methods aims to expose this type of violence, this particular form of violence in algorithmic societies through stage productions that are transdisciplinary and explore very different formats. So the first piece uh, was realized uh, last year and um, it's called Anfang and it's a sort of catastrophe out of time or better a catastrophe of our time so it's a piece for 12 performers two ai robotic prosthesis and uh, a deep reinforcement learning algorithm so the the core of the piece is a loop there is a loop which gets repeated over and over. The loop is um, a choreography that I created inspired by uh, praying gestures. And every time this loop is repeated, there is a dramaturgical variation that changes relationship between performers or between performance machine, performance and props. And this works by accumulation, so after 20 minutes, the loop has already transformed itself in something else, and, and different stories branch out of, of this mechanism. At the same time that the loop is repeated, there is another loop happening, which is the looping of the algorithm. So the algorithm performs the same loop in sync with the performers and tries to learn a meaningless sequence of numbers. This may sound counter-intuitive, uh, uh, but we chose to have this algorithm learning something completely meaningless uh, because we were not interested in the result of the algorithm, but rather in exposing the process through which the algorithm, this type of algorithm, learns. And so what happens in the piece is that as the algorithm tries to learn these numbers, um, every single computation that the algorithm does is translated into sound and into light pattern. So you can imagine a uh, quite strong and intense experience, a bit of a saturation at a sensorial level, uh, because the algorithm is very fast and produces this light and sound in a, in a very dynamic and uh, uh, fast-paced rhythm. 
and this is combined with the visual and corporeal experience of the performer uh, performing this loop on stage. And um, now we are taking this uh, approach further and we are going to develop other two pieces. Um, one is called uh, UR, Humane Methods UR, and it's a solo performance based again on the idea of the loop and on algorithmic violence. And then another work is entitled Exhale, Humane Methods Exhale, and uh, this will extend the ideas into a large-scale project where the audience will be invited to participate in these uh, looping stories. And uh, the algorithm, we have a very different uh, embodied approach to the show. And um, finally, I would like to show you and thank once again all my collaborators. Again, I think that it's very important and it's never enough repeated how crucial it is to collaborate among disciplines and how crucial it is to value the expertise of others uh, in the making of artistic ideas, especially for uh, performing arts. This may be already uh, familiar to uh, theater professionals, uh, but it's never a given. So what is important, I hope this talk has shown, is that particular artistic languages can emerge only from particular combination of expertises, of people, of ideas. Now, this becomes even more important when, when we talk about the body, because the body is a multi-layered concept that is, is pervasive and invisible at the same time. So, in order to talk about the body and its relation to technology, I think it's fundamental to explore collaboration between artists, scientists, philosophers, dancers, movers, theater makers, and so on. Because everyone can contribute different ideas. And uh, in particular, talking about technology, it's important that one have the understanding of the fundamental aspect of a particular technology, be it AI, be it a robot, be it interactive sound, or whatever. It's important to have that fundamental knowledge because that's the only way to then abuse the technology. So, it's never too useful to use a piece of technology for the purpose it was designed for, artistically speaking. It's much more interesting and much more uh, fertile to know the technology and know how you can turn it upside down, how you can hack it, how can you do other things. That, uh, that that technology is not supposed to be doing. And this is one way of using technology in, in combination with the body in order to go against uh, the normalization of the bodies, the exclusion of certain bodies, and the intolerance of certain bodies that we are witnessing uh, increasingly in our societies. So I hope this reflection stays with you for a bit and thanks for your patience until now and I hope these thoughts and these ideas can serve your practice as well or your curiosity. I'll see you somewhere hopefully soon in the world. Thank you.